known writing accepted thus far to mankind was written in cuneiform on what we call the Sumerian tablets. Tablet 3 of the Astrahasis text reads the following. Even the gods became afraid of the flood. They retreated. They went off to the heaven of Anu. There they are lying at the outside, cowering like dogs. Istar screams like a woman in labor. The lady of the god moans, she whose voice is so lovely. Ninti wept and was overcome with grief, saying, My creatures have become like flies. They filled the rivers like dragonflies. Their fatherhood was taken by the rolling sea. This is indicating that a mother figure of mankind could not bear the sight of this destruction. It goes on to describe how she was torn between staying with mankind as they suffered or to ascend up to heaven. Due to the fragments of the stone being in pieces, we do not know who answered her quandary, but the answer was clear. Ascend up to heaven to reside in the house of offerings. The bulk of the Sumerian tablets are not considered to be fiction. That is, of course, with the exception of this story and the rest of it. Once translated, it was considered to be the first sci-fi. After all, we seem to be talking about spaceships here. While it bears striking similarity to the biblical stories of a great flood, it was still considered fiction until recently, as we have uncovered the fact that a global flood did indeed occur during the Younger Dryas era. So now we can accept the that a global flood did occur, like the oral traditions indicate. But this particular part of the story, however, must still remain fiction, right? I can't help but find it strange that a woman named Phyllis Schlemmer described the same story even down to the weeping of the gods and even accurately stating their names. She made these claims before the science of the Younger Dryas was definitive, so her, her claims must also be fiction because it was obtained through channeling. But I am forced to ask myself though, what are the chances of this lucky guess? In school, we are taught that Nicole Nikola Tesla was a genius and invented the tech of our modern day, yet they conveniently left out the part that Nikola Tesla himself made clear. He claimed to have not come up with this information on his own, but gained it by channeling a higher source. The same goes for Edgar Cayce when it comes to healing thousands of people, yet he is not even mentioned in school whatsoever. After all, he did not have a medical degree. Yet, when doctors themselves were at a loss for explanations, they came to Edgar for answers. The truth always turns out to be stranger than fiction, but we refuse to let that sink in. The above-mentioned so-called gods that Phyllis spoke with said their goal was to teach each man and to prepare earth for a very specific kind of soul to inhabit for a very specific reason. It was told to her that these creatures could change their appearance within the psyche of man in order to take on a form that primitive man could understand. In our previous video, we compared this to how we appear to characters in a video game because those characters cannot possibly comprehend the player without an avatar. And speaking of the last video, we broke down the layout out of this map showing the worlds between the physical world that we live in and the primordial first cause, and of course, all of the inconceivably strange life forms that connect us. All of which, of course, seems like nonsense and imagination upon first glance, but after breaking down the inconsistencies within the fossil records, it eerily seems to answer many questions that have become a thorn in the ass of archaeology and science to this day. It has 
recently become safe to say that the more advanced we become in the field of archaeology and science, the closer we get to bridging the gap between it and the oral traditions passed down through mythology, ancient religions, and esoteric thought. While we should always maintain a healthy skepticism of all new earth-shattering information, we need to simultaneously recognize the fact that slowly but steadily, the stark logic of modern-day science is beginning to run parallel with the unbelievable. Because when the two come crashing together, we need to be ready. So to play my small part in preventing what could possibly be an inevitable event of mass hysteria, I would like to dive into the outskirts of what our minds can comprehend and bring disillusion to what we have been taught is impossible. When comparing these gaps in the fossil record to oral traditions passed down by indigenous people, we start to get into a little bit of a pickle. Almost every indigenous culture has a creation story that involves being created from people from the stars, usually specifically referring to Sirius B or the Pleiades. This reminds me quite a bit of how we used to treat the oral traditions of a flood myth before recently we found an ample amount of evidence of a great flood due to the Younger Dryas era. This is the same way that we used to treat the stories of a city called Troy and another called Babylon that were only dismissed as legend until irrefutable evidence popped up to conclude it as fact. In fact, the more that archaeology progressed the more these ancient oral traditions seem to come to life. So let's pretend for a moment that there's more to the oral traditions than just the imagination of ancient man, who we are told didn't have an imagination in the first place. And the contradictions are just... The idea of channeling ancient sentient beings is enough to make any skeptic change the channel, including me. Until I think about the fact that you are watching me over a phone right now and are quite literally, and I mean quite literally, channeling me as we speak because of technology. Let's set down Occam's razor for just a moment and explore what Phyllis Schlemmer and many others have said about the history of man and how it compares to these gaps in the fossil record and, and ancient oral traditions. Schlemmer was supposedly in contact with a being that was known in Egypt as Tahiti, known by many other ages as Thoth, but in today's age as just Tom. Tom indicated that a species resembling man emerged about 20 million years ago, which already kind of helps us out with some of the strange artifacts that have been found that just don't fit in the timeline that we have been taught. But they were here to help develop the planet as a paradise for a specific genre of souls that would eventually inhabit it. At the same time, there were beings that walked the earth to prepare it for its particular density. That would be set later for other their souls to inhabit. It is then said that extraterrestrial colonies of humanoid beings began to seed onto the earth particular outcasts from other civilizations by oftentimes mixing the DNA of their gene pool with that of the creatures of earth. There seems to be experimentation going on that had an agenda. This helps us explain the sudden disappearances and replacements of certain kinds of humans with the hundred thousand year gaps that we see in the fossil records. It also kind of helps us explain why human babies are so weak and helpless compared to, well, any other creature that is native to Earth. A concept of which doesn't quite line up with natural evolution, considering that the whole idea of evolution in the first place is for a species to get stronger and better. Tom insists that the beginning of man's advancement is dated to about 32,400 BC because of a, a species called the Hoovids or Hoova, which obviously is where we get the name for the Hoover vacuum cleaner. Make the connections, people. The people indigenous to Earth were said to call this species the hawk, 
or equivalent to that kind of bird because this is apparently how they appeared to them. This is when Earth began to go from a paradise to becoming a popular spot for beings or souls who were not wanted on their home planet or home dimensional density. This is interesting considering that anthropologists have just recently indicated that modern man came to its full brain capacity about 35,000 years ago. Also interesting, indigenous man was said to be quite small compared to our visitors, the Huvids and the Altians. And keep them in mind later, by the way, the Altians. But they were both considered giants at this time. This, of course, connects us to several other oral traditions and mythology, as well as skeletons in the closet at the Smithsonian Museum. The attempt to teach native earthlings agriculture and the arts was a practical failure in the beginning because once the natives spread out on their own without the guidance of the Huvids or the Altians, they were helpless to the elements due to being underdeveloped. But the earthlings whose genome had been mixed with that of the Altians went on to create a society that has been referred to as, drum roll please, Atlantis or Altia, if you want to get back to the uh, original source of it. This channeling of Tom by Phyllis Schlemmer indicates the fall of Atlantis to be 13,000 years ago. While rummaging in the Akashic Records, though, Edgar Cayce also indicated the fall of Atlantis to have been 13,000 years ago. And if you are not already thinking of it, I might as well tell you that modern geologists are just now today, accepting the evidence presented by Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock of a great gigantic catastrophe mentioned on this channel many times as the Younger Dryas era that happened, well, 13,000 years ago. But what happened to Atlantis? Was it a natural disaster? Was it man-made mutual assured destruction like in war? Or could it be that it was indeed wiped out on purpose by external forces? Well, like many other conundrums discussed on this channel, it seems to be none of the above as well as all of the above. Why? Well, this common theme that runs down the center of our human race and existence is terrifying. But we just keep repeating ourselves. It seems as though the fall of Atlantis was due to hubris, that being the abuse of our power and technology in conjunction and adjacent to the natural order of the earth. This shouldn't be surprising as it is strikingly familiar, but with a slightly different plot twist as we'll see here. Edgar Cayce spoke about the Atlanteans having a powerful and terrible vibrational crystal that produced energy. Powerful because it could be used as a tool, but just like any tool, like a hammer, for example, you can use it to build a shed or you can beat yourself in the face with it, therefore causing old Papa Cayce to refer to it as terrible. It was said that the elites of Atlantis used this tool to propagate their own power, thus abusing it, creating a chain reaction of resonance adjacent to Earth's natural frequency. This chain reaction, like dominoes, got out of control, leading up to a long set of natural disasters, global natural disasters. Parallel to this legend is an invention by the great mind of Nikola Tesla. Nikola understood that the earth had a natural vibration to it. He utilized a sort of iron pillar as an oscillator and would adjust the frequency until he found a particular resonance that would cause the earth to vibrate or shake. Now, this makes me want to go down a rabbit hole of how the builders of the pyramids may, might have lifted the stones into place, but we'll save that for a, another video. As Nikki adjusted the frequency of the oscillator, everyone in nearby areas went into panic as their buildings began to shake. Upon realizing this, though, Lil Nikki shut it down and abandoned that particular research. But uh, not to worry, though, that research is currently in the safe hands of the U.S. government today. Some of my best friends are scientists. This, and I love them, and they do such good work, but they are going to kill us all. <laughs> Atomic bomb, baby. If you cut the atom this way, it can power the world with electricity, and if you cut it that way, it can blow everything up. Guess which one we tried first? Like, <laughs> that's just who we are. 1918, 
they, they had a sample. So the idea was they were going to reanimate it so that they could study it. The 1918 pandemic flu, they had a little sample of it and it hadn't been a scourge in the earth for a hundred years. And they thought to themselves, what if we just, I don't know, woke it up? <laughs> and nobody in the room was like, no, <laughs> let's not do that. But they did that. Here's how I believe the world ends. And I say this to you uh, uh, in, in, in sincerity. We are a screwed up world. Racism, income inequality, fascism, authoritarianism, all these horrible, horrible things. Uh, uh, natural resources that run down. Th that'll all be fine. <laughs> the world ends, the last words man utters are somewhere in a lab. A guy goes, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> So let's look at another couple coincidences, this time involving language, and as well as the scattering of languages. It is said that the indigenous people were only able to communicate by grunts and animal noises, but uh, due to experiments, splicing, tutoring conducted by the Altians, a common language of purely consonants came to be so that these differing civilizations could communicate. This seems to answer the question that has plagued philologists and linguists for many years. That being how many of today's languages appear to sprout from one original language that has been lost to history. And it just so happens to be that the ancient Hebrew language did not involve any vowels. And ancient Hebrew, of course, is where we get the bulk of today's biblical doctrines. Some of you know there are a few more connections and coincidences with this considering the Hebrew language, but I'll have to refer you to one of our previous videos called Lost Knowledge and Hidden Wisdom for all of that. Language of a common form would have been necessary to build gigantic and possible structures like the Hindu temples that we see today that actually have moving and rotating parts that frankly seem to be like generators and structures like the Great Pyramids that are found all over the world. During one of these channeling sessions, it was indicated that the Great Pyramid of Giza was meant to be an indestructible time capsule that laid out for future generations the dimensions of our place in the universe. Well, it just so happens to be that we are only finding out today that the pyramids perfectly and mathematically encapsulate the dimensions of Earth's size and the ratios of the relationship between the Sun, Earth, Earth and Moon. I'll have to stop there though considering that we covered that extensively also in the previous video, Lost Knowledge and Hidden Wisdom. Yeah, you're gonna wanna have to, I guess, click on that one after this. Feed my algorithm. Feed it like the Archons. Click on my videos. That was, that was my attempt at hypnosis. Should I do this or maybe I need a spoon or something? How the fuck did Dolores Cannon hypnotize people? I want to find that out. That, that she, ah, she got people hypnotized. Like people who couldn't be. Unless it's all fake, I don't know. So there are many more connections between this theory and mythologies, religions, and, and of course, brand new scientific discoveries that I just won't be able to fit into one video. But nevertheless, to cap this thing off, let's define what healthy skepticism means. I want to be clear that what I mean by healthy skepticism specifically refers to not getting fucked over by another party due to false information. What it does not mean is to build a wall between yourself and new information that just so happens to be abstract to you and your current place on your path. In fact, that's the opposite of what it means. That would be called ignorance, literally. To be blunt, if you were a huge fan of my Gnostic lore videos but dismissed the stories put forth here today, you might have missed the point. At the same time, if you loved our video entitled Ancient Teachers of Man, but completely dismissed the names involved in this story, you have willfully ignored several obvious parallels. After all, the Hoover sounds a lot like Jehovah, which I'm assuming that uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are sponsored by Hoover and only use Hoover specifically for their carpet cleaning. And uh, Hoover, if you're watching this right now, uh, I'll, uh, 
I'll sponsor your product considering not being related to it whatsoever. Hoover's probably out of business for freaking 10 years now. There's some like fucking 22 year old watching this right now going, who is Hoover? But the only difference between this story that we have covered here today and those prior videos that have become quite popular on this channel is the concept of visitors from other dimensions and or outer space. The Gnostic lore series is genred by a biblical personality. Our video, Ancient Teachers of Man, and the Black Cube video, of course, that haunts me to this day, seem to fall under the genre of mythology. What we talked about here today seems to me at least like the same story or even a sequel to those stories, but with a hue or tint of sci-fi to it. Why does this cause so many people, including the open-minded, to just shut it out? In the intro of this video, we stated the obvious, that truth seems to always be stranger than fiction. Knowing damn well that this is the case, we should understand our own psychological biases enough to realize what our ego tends to do to us and our, and our souls. Logic is useful here in the real world, where we have jobs and taxes and credit scores. But when it comes to creation myths and the obvious fact that something did happen once upon a time, cause I mean, here we are, let's not slit our throats on Occam's razor. Let's use logic, but be careful not to carry it around on our backs. You have a slip disc anyway, and you need to go take a hot Epsom salt bath, you damn cripple. We need to look in the mirror and face ourselves and realize that if the real definitive truth was to come up, introduce itself, and then bite you in the ass, well, we probably wouldn't even recognize it. I don't know if this story is true or not, despite how well it fits into the gaps and connects the puzzle pieces. But I do know that if it was the truth, our limited langual mammalian brain species would be the first to throw its baby out with the bathwater.